Welcome to Digital Asset News, where we take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we're going to talk about some important levels that I think everybody needs to be aware of as far as like what is going on with Ethereum and why the 25th of June is so important as options are set to expire. We're going to take a look at a couple of different levels and where things should be. On top of that, on positive news, we're going to take a look at Guggenheim CEO Scott Menard as he tweets out, that cryptocurrency is the future. And this is kind of odd because Scott in the past has given some conflicting information. And then finally, on the good news of the day or the uplifting news, we've got Charles Hoskinson saying that Ethereum will beat Bitcoin in the long run. Crazy. So we'll take a look at all those things, but first let's take a look at what's going on into the markets. Uh, today it is the 18th? Yeah, 18th of June, about uh, 10 a.m. El Paso, Texas time. And uh, Mark is down again. We're at uh, 1.5 trillion. And again, this is gonna play into, in, into what we just saw with the options expiration. So it's important that we take a look at these levels just to make sure that we're on the right track and what's going on. Everything is down. Uh, let's just call a spade a spade. Uh, we're gonna see uh, Bitcoin uh, roughly 36.6, might fall even lower. We're at 5% just in 24 hours. Ethereum's down, Tether's Tether, nobody cares. N nothing's up in 24 hours. And um, we might see a little bit more bloodshed. T fuel's up. And remember, uh, Theta, they're launching their mainnet 3.0 at the end of June. So I think T fuel is going to keep going up until that happens. But that's what's going on. Let's just jump into today's top story. And oh, actually, before we do that, just so you know, I had a great interview uh, with the team leads over there at, uh, at Silo. And I'll be doing a uh, uh, putting together the video and editing it and putting it over at Dan Clips. This I think is a huge sleeper. And to me, this is kind of like one of those projects that is a, it's a super app, really. It's digital wallet plus a totally encrypted messenger app that you can actually download right now and use. I have it on my phone. I have been using it. It works great. So uh, I'll release that, gosh, hopefully by tonight or tomorrow, I have to have the team look at it. And uh, it'll be over there on Digital Asset News Clips where we do all the advancement things and all the things that are up and coming. Anyhow, this, my friends, is what's going on. 25th of June, uh, we've got a, this is next Friday. Uh, so this is a pretty important level to take a look at. So 25th of June carries significant importance as it may assist Ethereum in reaching its all-time high range, potentially. But in the past, it's on the exact opposite. So according to SKU, 646,300 ETH options will undergo expiration on the 25th of June, which is worth over $1.5 billion in open interest. And some people may say, well, who cares? Uh, you know, because it's only 1.5 billion and Ethereum is like way beyond that. But just like we saw with Iron Finance, when you just see a bunch of, uh, of sales going on, even whales, people who, who have a lot of those, uh, those, that cryptocurrency, and in this case, you know, options, once you start seeing things just go sideways or go down, people start selling, it seems like everybody starts to sell. So it is a domino effect. And sometimes it is what it is. Sometimes it's just an, it's an overvalued asset or sometimes it's just, it's just panic selling. Whatever you want to call it, uh, it could not be good news potentially for Ethereum as things start to uh, slide off. So this is what we have to look at. Expiration is, or expiry is 33% larger than the one that took place on 26th of March. And here's how the market unfolded after that first quarterly expiration. And what I'm gonna do, let me blow this up so you can see what I see. So here, we're looking at 2021. We're talking about uh, March 26th. See, there's a little bit of a, it just kind of like went down, down, down. And then that, essentially is what happened as far as like, it just kind of took a little bit of a, of a dip. Five days prior to the expiry, Ethereum's, Ethereum's value had dropped 15% in the charts, in the charts, the charts. However, between 26th of March and 15th of April, ETH's price surged by 60%. So down, down, down as all the expiration went, uh, came about and then boom, just started to take off and then off we go. So be aware of what's going on here because a lot of people will just they'll they'll look at and go okay well we just lost 15 percent, 20 percent, whatever else it is and they start to panic sell and everybody starts to sell but if you take a look at the history not like it's going to definitely happen again remember this is investment opinion not investment advice you can see what happened in the past so we had a bit of a drop and then it just kind of took off again now Unfortunately, if you take a look at the same chart, where are we again? We still went down. So this is a good idea to lock in your profits. Nobody ever went broke taking profits, but it's just important for these levels so that you're aware of by next Friday. And then to finish this up, according to data from uh, Bybit or Bibit, whatever you say it, Bybit, there is a huge amount of call options at 2200 with higher strikes. 
It means that Ether's price needs to be above 2200 when the expiration takes place for these 97,000 call options to come into play. Otherwise, they'll be completely worthless. And it, uh, so, and also similarly, uh, if the strike price at 2100 at press time, Ethereum is consolidating near 2400. So the upper hand is on the bullish side, but a lot can change in a week. So we're looking at $2,200. And just as we saw over here, trade the chain, we are looking at a price today at 2242. Now look, in seven days, a lot can change. A lot can change. But if you're taking a look at what could potentially happen, once we start to dip down below that, just be aware that we could see some downside volatility, but it is normal. And this is one of the reasons why. So let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's move on to our next piece, which is Scott Menard, Chief Investment Officer uh, for Guggenheim. Been around a long, long time. He's been in the, the traditional market and he's been a convert to crypto and digital assets. And it's kind of weird because he's been one of those guys who has randomly just put out tweets and some people say that he's kind of like manipulating a little bit with his tweets, which maybe, I don't know. But uh, he does, he's been a, a supporter of crypto for a while, but just not too long ago, uh, during that weekend when we're supposed to have like this huge dip, he put out a tweet and said something like, uh, hey, be careful, massive volatility coming in. And uh, for all you investors, you know, just make sure that you're, uh, you know, aware of what's going on, which is pretty sweet and nice for a guy who uh, runs a company that has like, you know, it's, uh, it manages over seven, $270 billion. That's nice. Some people said, nah, we think he's just, uh, you know, manipulating, but hey, maybe he's a nice guy. Maybe I'm just naive. Who knows? Anyhow, this is what he said. Scott Menard, CIO of Guggenheim, said that while crypto is a volatile asset, it's the paradigm of the future. And he's right. When you're looking at these different YouTubers out there and you read different reports and all these different things, you have to understand there is two sides to the story for everything as far as like crypto, even traditional markets and equities and things like that. There are traders who are really just, in, they're just obsessed with a short term type of trade, a gain, whether that be on the hour, on the day, on the week, swing trades, whatever else it is. And then there's the other side of people like me who are just investors and we just are in it for the long haul. I'm not a big I don't really care too much about the uh, short-term volatility because I see where things are going. And when Scott is talking about this, he really is putting on his investor hat and going, this is the asset of the future. So when he says things like, hey, expect volatility, he's right. He was 100% right. And uh, there was huge volatility in those last two weeks uh, ago. So eh, take it for what it is. And he says, uh, crypto will continue to be volatile, but as a paradigm in the future. He noted that, that the, uh, and this was interesting, he also noted that the potential for an attack on our payments infrastructure is one of the largest external threats to the financial system as a whole. And he states, the possibility of an attack on the global payment system is one of the biggest exogenous risks to the stability of the financial system. I never thought about that, but I, now it makes a lot of sense. Everything that is so centralized in the banks, and we see a lot of things that are going on with uh, ransomware and different hackers from across the world, and they're really getting into these, these corporations and these entities, and they're demanding all this money because they're shutting things down. Why couldn't they do that with SWIFT? Why couldn't they do that with the infrastructures uh, as far as like the payment system like Scott is talking about? A great way to get around that, probably decentralization. So, I mean, if you're going to talk about these things, I think we should talk about everything. And uh, I'm going to put that in a little feather in my cap to try to remember those things as I'm debating people on the uh, benefits of crypto and digital assets because uh, as far as, as it pertains to decentralization. It makes a lot of sense. And then lastly, uh, he says, why am I so sanguine, optimistic about inflation? There's three words, demographics, debt, and technology. Our shrinking workforce, slowing birth rate, rising debt loads, and adoption of tech that improves economic productivity are all deflationary. Debate that in the comment section. I'm not for sure. He also said that Guggenheim has seen no evidence that inflation is contributing to increase in prices and that the bond bull market is over. So, uh, <laughs> look, I'll agree with Scott on the very first parts, which is crypto is the future. It makes a lot of sense to me and that we should use it uh, as far as like to protect the payment system that we have right now because it is ripe for an attack. And I think that uh, uh, a nation state could really just do a lot of damage with just uh, cyber warfare. Totally agree. As far as like the inflation things, I see a lot of things around me that are going up in price. The dollar's still strong. And we had uh, Nick Mancini on from, from TTC yesterday, and he pretty much laid out a pretty great case as far as like assets and, and the strength of the dollar. But um, I just... I just can't get my head around 
that the, the Fed can print 30% of the entire uh, circulating supply of the dollar in the last year, and we're not gonna see inflation. Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know where uh, our opinions differ in the comments section. Let's finish up with our last piece, piece which is I think like a pretty good, <laughs> a pretty good article. I like this one. Charles Hoskins, everybody's favorite person to, to rip on, besides Mark Cuban lately and his DeFi thing. But uh, there was a, it was a good uh, interview between him and Lex Friedman, and he just comes out and says, hey, Ethereum will beat Bitcoin in the long run. And I thought it was, uh, it's good to know, and I'm glad this, uh, uh, the Herald Sheets uh, brought it up. So during a five-hour interview with AI researcher Lex Friedman, and I'm going to link this in the comments or in the uh, description below, it's five hours. It's a five hour interview and I've been breaking it up. I'm at uh, over just about an hour or so now. I'm trying to get the other four, but it's fascinating. And it's really interesting where they talk about where things uh, started uh, as far as like uh, Hoskinson with, you know, his, his uh, where he got into with, with Bitcoin and then, and then a little bit in Ethereum and then how Cardano works and how the whole infrastructure is going to work and everything else. But he's very positive about Ethereum. So I think that's good. We need more of those things in this community because as you know, just go over Twitter and you'll have uh, no shortage of people poo-pooing all over other projects. So he states this, the problem with Bitcoin is it's slow. Well, let's be honest, it's kind of slow. It's like the mainframe programming of the past. The only reason it's still around is because there was so much invested in keeping it around I was kind of happy to leave it there. Okay, so that's that's one part that Charles will say, and I can understand what he's saying here, but uh, you know he does have a good point here. A lot can be done to improve the Bitcoin network in order to make it a system to beat. He said Bitcoin is too slow, and that's its methodical development process is a huge hindrance to its involvement. Charles said that Ethereum doesn't have all these shortcomings due to the fact that its developers love involvement. Ethereum is getting to a point where it has a similar network effect to Bitcoin. Very true. I mean, we see a lot of things being built. I mean, everything's built on Ethereum. What am I saying? And as far as like DeFi and things that are locked up. So yes, the only thing is, can they roll out Ethereum 2.0 and really get things going? And let's see how that EIP 1559 works out as far as uh, burning gas fees and tipping uh, the miners. I don't know. Hopefully it uh, reduces those uh, crazy uh, gas fees. Uh, and then to finish up, and so that means if you look at the trajectory of things, if I had to bet on just those two systems, Bitcoin or Ethereum, I would say nine times out of 10, Ethereum is going to win the fight against Bitcoin. It was the only competitor. And it makes sense. Um, Ethereum, it seems like, you know who said it gr really well was Terry Crews, the actor. And uh, they, they asked him, uh, you know, how do you differentiate between Bitcoin and Ethereum? He goes, well, Bitcoin's Gold 2.0, really, it's like gold. He goes, but Ethereum is the oil for my machines. He goes, I like to create, I like to build things, I like to get into businesses. So I need that oil to run the machine. And that's what Ethereum does. And I'm like, it's a pretty good way to, to look at it. If, you know, Bitcoin's like a store of value. It's like gold. And then uh, Ethereum kind of lubricates everything and makes all the engines run. And then to finish up, uh, Charles says, but obviously we're here and a lot of other people are here. So there's different things going on. It's a much more complex game. And look, I don't know if one if there's one coin to rule them all if it's just going to be a, a one game system i don't think so because i mean we have so many different projects where blockchain and decentralization and smart contracts and DeFi and and digital id and all the good stuff that uh, that comes out of this this sector can do i just don't think that one one project can rule them all and really encompass everything. I think it's going to take a, a community effort. And that's why I'm hoping that uh, we can drop some of the uh, tribalism and just get on board uh, with each other. We're like brothers and sisters, if you think about it. And uh, if you attack, attack one of us, government, then you got to attack us all. That's just my two cents. All right. So that's it for today. So look, uh, if you made it all the way to the end, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, consider uh, liking the video if you liked it. Uh, consider subscribing uh, because a lot of things we talk about are time sensitive on this channel. Over on Dan Clips, we do more of the advancement stuff and more of the up and coming projects. Uh, we've already taken a look at World Mobile Token, which I think is going to change everything in Africa. We'll take a look at uh, Charlie and Card Starter and uh, Indigo Protocol. And uh, we're going to be doing one with uh, uh, Jiro Wallet. And we just got done with the um, uh, Wallet Silo or as I call it, the super app. So that'll be up soon. So check it over at Dan Clips, links in the description. Thanks so much. See you on the next one.